just get a sense of uh, the participants here. How, how many of you are from the secondary schools? Teachers from secondary schools? Number. Anyone from the polys here? No one from the poly here. Interesting. Everyone is you know, teaching Java apart from RP. Uh, then the rest are, yeah, I'm not sure where you are, MOE maybe. Okay, I, 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 my, my talk, uh, I'm just going to basically share with you um, the fact that you know, RP, first of all, obviously it uses Python. Um, and we have used it, uh, I believe, since 2008 or 2009. I think 2009. Um, so there is no need for me to tell you basically, you know, why we chose uh, Python, right? Uh, I think it's. Um, I hope most of you who are here are. Uh, it's quite apparent to you why why Python was the, the language that we chose. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit more about um, uh, our experience, uh, the, the pedagogical aspects. You know what? Uh, you know, RP, those of you who don't know, okay, I don't know whether I'm making assumptions. So you all know about Republic Polytechnic, right? <laughs> just, just in case. We are the fifth polytechnic uh, located in Woodlands. Okay, if you ever been to Woodlands, uh, you know you can go and visit. We are there. We are the fifth polytechnic. Okay, and we do problem based learning by and large the whole institution. Um, so I'll show you that our experience with doing that. So so what this 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 talk that I'm giving, why would it be of interest to you? I guess if you are in a position to explore different pedagogies, right? Apart from just a normal lecture, tutorial, lab, uh, if you want to explore different things. Uh, and you've heard about problem-based learning, you know, why, why, um, why should it be of interest to you and what experiences have we gathered that could be of value to you and then, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to share that. And then we'll also talk about how we also use something called cognitive apprenticeship. Okay, um, but uh, I should premise my talk with the fact that uh, you need to understand a little bit about the profile of our students, okay. Um, we, we get secondary school students, ITs and international students, uh, the percentage I've shown on the screen. Um, now, the majority of our students uh, seem not to have performed as well academically, you know, by the traditional measure, uh, if you measure by O-level uh, scores. 30% um, uh, uh, with the O-level aggregate score between 24 to 26 points. Uh, this is as high, the 26 is as high as you can go where poly entry is concerned, okay? Uh, and the average uh, ELR 2B2 score of 32.8. So that's uh, e, B, uh, e being English, uh, R stands for relevant subject, which tends to be science and maths, and, and B, uh, the best two other subjects. So if you accumulate their O level scores, uh, it's, it's quite high. You know, right? Those of you who are coming from the schools. Uh, and the manual posting percentages are also relatively high. Uh, so those are the students that we do get in uh, public polytechnic. Um, so this is quite a ch challenging lot, and I, I would say that uh, and, and, and some of the things that we do at the institution uh, factors this uh, factors this particular fact. All right, there are a lot of things that we would like to be able to do that we can't always do. You know, like I think later on you see later in the lightning that. The, the Dunman High School kids are going to set up something, some project that they do, some interesting projects that they do. You know, there are a lot of things that we would like to do with our students, but sometimes we can't. Okay, given where they are coming from. The other thing that uh, that, 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 that there is a concern for students at uh, as of uh, 2013, uh, 45 percent of our students require some form of financial assistance, which is quite quite high, right? And 14.5 percent of the students come from families with a per capita income of less than. 500. Okay, so what it, what this means for us is that my cohort of students, a lot of them have to work uh, after school, right? And the amount of time that they have to revise and all that is, is not is not very much. So so that's the background where we are coming from. Um, okay. Okay. So so uh, uh, just one slide on RP's journey with Python and Python. So so like I said, we introduced uh, Python in, since 2009, and it's proven to be the right decision at that time when it was made. Uh, and and, and we teach about 1,800 to 2,000 students every academic year. Okay, uh, I'm not sure what is it like in your schools, but uh, I think that's a hell of a lot of students uh, for us to manage. And our teaching teams are roughly between 15 to 20 member teaching teams per semester. Uh, and, and half of them are associates or uh, they, are, they work with us on a, a part-time basis. Right? So that's, that's roughly uh, where uh, the 
the situation at the Republic Polytechnic. Now actually, with, when we introduced Python, one of the things that, that started from it was, you know, what was, it, uh, what was the Python adoption like in the community? Uh, we, weren't, we weren't sure, and at, at that point, we had a director who just tossed the idea about, hey, how about running a Python conference, you know? You know, I heard about this uh, PyCon conference that runs in the US, and then how about doing something here? And then, uh, as I happened to be a, an employee of the organization, it was sort of task to me to, 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 to look into this. Well, long story short, then we formed a non-profit society uh, called the Python User Group in 2009, and then we started the first Python APEC conference in 2010. And so I think, I, I'm not sure how many of you were there. I know Chris was there uh, the first time when we ran it because he was in SMU. Uh, I don't think anyone else was there. There. I thought you were not there, right? So, so a lot of you were not there. So we started that in 2010. Uh, I mean, at this point, just a shout out to the people who are involved in Python User Group. I mean, there are a whole bunch of volunteers, and I, I don't know what is the context by which you are here this, this morning, but you know, if you are a teacher and, uh, and you're teaching Python, or you are you know of developers and all that, I mean, see yourselves as, as someone within the community rather than someone outside looking in and seeing what I can get from it. Because a lot of things that happens with this conference uh, happens because they are volunteers, you know, like Ivan, like Mr. Guy. They, 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 they put in their time uh, they, because they are passionate about things, they're passionate about forming a, a community of, of folks that can, you know, sh share and learn from one another. And, and it's, it's, it's really, um, you know, all their efforts. So, so I would encourage you, you know, to, to consider that, how, how you perhaps can contribute back to the community as well. Yeah, so, so that's a little bit of the, the history. Okay, okay so problem-based learning in RP. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about problem-based learning before uh, and, and how it's practiced uh, in, um, in different places. RP basically adopts a model that is called uh, one day, one problem, by and large. Okay? It was solely one day, one problem for all our schools, all the faculties, all our modules. Okay, so you can think about maths being problem-based learning, you think about uh, you know, a communication subject being problem-based learning. Everything was in problem-based learning. Uh, since then, there have been some variations being introduced, but by and large, this was the model that was uh, adopted. Okay. So one day, one problem. Basically, uh, uh, the day was broken up into the following: right, three learning phases, two study breaks. I mean, I'm telling you some of these things because it, it does affect what you can do within the class and, and what problems you can you can give within the class. So three learning phases means uh, they, 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 they meet the, the facilitators one hour in the morning, then they have a study break, which actually tends to be their breakfast. Uh, then they have another period where they're supposed to come together to, to work on a problem that is proposed to them. Then they have a longer study break, which also can tend to be a lunch for them as well. Uh, but they're supposed to still continue working on the problem. And then they do a presentation of their solution uh, for the day. Okay, that's, that's probably how it is. So what happens is the students spend a day on a module, right? Unlike some of the other places where we do a few different modules in a day, in RP, the student focuses on one module a day. Uh, but the downside of it, you might say, is that they don't encounter the module again until after one week has passed. So um, I think you've seen those charts that say, like, you know, what do they remember after, you know, X number of hours, X number of days? Uh, so we do suffer that problem by the time if they don't do anything in between, and not that we don't encourage them to do it, we actually give them things to do, but you know, sometimes they don't you remember my first slide about where these students are coming from. Uh, by the time we see them again, you know, uh, you know, quite a number of things have you know, left them. So that is some, some of the challenge we face. Um, we, do, we do have the benefit of students having working in classes of 25, working in teams of 5, right? And like I say, problem based learning, there is a problem trigger that provides the context for the learning. Uh, there's very student-centered uh, approach, um, but uh, not not long from when it was just a problem. Then something called worksheets were introduced. Okay, the bit of history why worksheets were introduced for every 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 subject. But but one of the key reasons was that it was supposed to act as a scaffold, right? In the early days of RP, people said, "Ah, parents would come and say, ah, can learn ah. We don't know teacher teach and can learn, is it?" So so the scaffold uh, to some extent acts like a little bit of a teacher. Okay. So, okay, so learning experience, uh, early days, the problem trigger sets the context and, and um, well, a, a lot of effort was put into uh, coming up with problems that were very interesting and I, and, and I would say that 
um, I have seen how students get really, really engaged uh, by, by if, if the problem trigger is really interesting. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you can you, you can see their their eyes light up, you know, with, with you know enthusiasm and excitement. With you know, I, you know, I've learned something. The problem was interesting, and I see its relevance. You know, uh, that's where they, they, they might say things like, you know, I learned a lot of maths in school, but then I don't know how is it applied in school. You know, and then I got to give it back to the teacher. I didn't see the relevance. But it's not the problems we managed to set. We, we, we literally can see the lights, the eyes of the, the, the student light up because of the, the context that really made it interesting for them. Okay, um, and, and the other thing with the, with, with the, the one of the, the things about the the context is um, it, we, we we do, however, we're faced with constraints because of our structure. Because, uh, because of our structure and because of our, uh, the ability of our students. And, uh, because sometimes you, when you want to set interesting context, interesting scenarios for them to solve, um, it, whether the students are able to handle that, 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 that problem is one thing, and whether they can handle it within the context of the structure of the day, because it's like one day, one problem, right? They only have so many hours uh, to, before they can yeah, they're expected to solve a problem. So we, we, we do have that challenge, right? Um, so so that's, that's one learning experience for us. So that is to say, if you are a, a teacher in the school or I don't know, you're an MOE and if, if, if for whatever reason you're thinking about problem-based learning, uh, that's, that's something for you to consider, you know? Yeah, we, the context is important, the structure happens to be important as well to allow the students the, the time and space needed for them to explore uh, the, the, the problem space. So we did we didn't have those constraints. Uh, the teacher is obviously key, you know. Uh, first of all, when when is the teacher not key? Uh, so like I said, a lot, a lot, a lot of things that happened in this conference also because like we, we, you know, Mr. Gee, you know, uh, some of your teachers uh, may not know your names will be involved in organizing this. Um, now, PBL promotes uh, the the, the idea of PBL is that it promotes self-directed learning, right? But the practice of programming. Uh, but one of the challenges we have is, but for novice learners. Uh, was PBL always the, 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 the best thing, okay? Uh, uh, hence, you know, later on I lead to cognitive apprenticeship and why we introduce it, okay? Uh, so some of, the some of the, the things we face is that uh, our teachers, uh, sometimes they, um, they, they teach too much, all right? Because one of the things with problem-based learning as well is we want to we want to get us to teach the, the thinking processes, right? We want to, because we, it's not just about being able to to do something, but we, we also want to, you know, ask them questions like, you know, what, what, what were you thinking of? What, what, uh, how were you thinking through a problem? You know, things like that. Uh, but, but sometimes when we, what happens is that we get teachers who, who, who do teach so much that uh, then there's there's not enough thinking on the part of the students. Okay, so so that happens as well. Because look, all of us come from a background where we were basically sitting down like all of you are and just listening to someone talk and. And then we basically model that right with our students. So we have teachers who are like that. Then we also had uh, teachers who also went the other way around. You know, they, they came to an institution like RP that said, you know, RP problem based learning. Therefore, you know, student centered learning. So student centered learning means uh, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to pass the problem to you, and therefore I'm going to basically ask you. So what do you think? You know, you ask the students what you what do you think. Uh, so that was a situation. So when the students practice too much self directedness. Uh, you know, they were expecting too much thinking from the students as well. And again, like I said, given the background of our students, you know, a lot of them, quite a number of them couldn't manage that. Okay. Uh, the other challenge is that not all student teachers come from a CS background or have actually programmed professionally. You know. the, that's the, the honest truth. I don't know the situation with MOE, whether you can find enough teachers as well to teach, but uh, we, if I, if I look at our teaching teams of the, 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 the to 20 uh, staff that we have, uh, uh, I, I, I see leakage problems. Quite a lot of them were engineers originally, uh, or, or from different professions or originally, and then for some reason, somehow they, they came into the, you know to teach in an IT school. So yeah, all teachers from a CS background. Um, 
Uh, the other challenge, well, is the teacher thing again. Uh, it's not able to engage effectively. This is more on a personal level. So, because education is fundamentally a human activity, right? You, you need to be able to, uh, especially in PBL and RP, you know, a lot of uh, one, to, 1 to 25, and, and, and within that, teams of five, we, 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 and every student gets a grade at the end of the day, you know? Uh, so, to be able to give a grade to a student at the end of the day, there are a lot of different data points that we need to sample in order to give a student an A grade or, or, or a D grade, right? So it's uh, in our mean to do that, you know, uh, it's a lot, a lot of work, okay? A lot of work from, for the lectures. So that was uh, PBL for us. Um, okay, I will just skip on this slide. Um, um, just something I thought was interesting, but that you're not really about learning of facts or training of the mind to think and uh, I'm not sure whether we be all subject matters experts uh, so we teach subject matter so I'm not sure how much of us think about training the uh, mind the, the, the thinking part. Okay. So so having done that, we very very quickly run through what we did at, at RP with problem based learning. What we also found um, a couple of semesters back also uh, was uh, this is what students were saying, right? Uh, because we saw that the results were, were not as encouraging as we had hoped, right? Uh, there were things that we thought were simple enough for students to learn, but for some reason they had difficulty grasping them. You know, so we had those challenges. And then this was the other thing that we found out that 68% uh, of the students that we surveyed said they got stuck easily and don't know how to proceed, right? Uh, and 6% said they don't know how to even start. 11% said they were fearful of making mistakes. So in total, you know, like a fair percentage of the students had some problem with starting something and doing something even. Uh, the rest who say cannot find time and don't feel like it, uh, so uh, difficult to save, uh, you know, because they were just not doing anything. Uh, so so um, now, like, like, again, like I mean, so for better ability group students, your experience could be very different, right, from our experience and what we had to do, okay? Um, so somewhere in February 2012, and February this year as well, there was a blog uh, post by Mark Gustiel talks about you know what's the best way to teach computer science to beginners and and while he on the left hand side he prescribes that yeah we, we how we teach normally we teach subject matter subject then we expect them to program lah right we just you know give the problem to them or give the exercise to them and they go program and that's basically how you learn um, well he was suggesting that. Um, that uh, for novice programmers, okay, we're not talking about intermediate programmers or so, I think he's talking about novice programmers in particular, uh, some uh, instructional guidance would be helpful, would be necessary uh, before you actually get them to program themselves. Okay, Not to say that getting them to program is not the way to go, because yes, they do have to get to program, but whether do you do it at the stage where they are just starting out. So if you had a blog post, I mean, you can go and check out his uh, post there. So we introduced something called quantity apprenticeship which was basically, um, you know, uh, providing students a little bit more instructional guidance, uh, especially when they, we introduce them to new programming concepts for the first time, okay, or maybe even for the second time, okay. Uh, so, so, and, and the, the idea here was that uh, we wanted the teachers to basically observe the or model the computational thinking and programming problem solving process. And as my next slide will say, would suggest that then the students will actually code, code life uh, in front of the students. So the students can observe, they can enact and practice the skill. Um, I saw this uh, picture there that, uh, so, you know, you Google quality apprenticeship, this big image comes out, it's all like shows you pictures of people, us having all the gears in place, uh, and then it's uh, how to get the gears in place for the student that you're trying to teach. Uh. So that, I think that's the, 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 tough, the tough challenge. So coding life in front of the class was one of the things that, uh, that the, the teachers had to, had to do. Uh, it wasn't apparent that everybody was the most comfortable in doing it, but there was a positives with it, right? Because the best part with typing code in front of people is that, and if you're typing anything substantial, is that you probably may not uh, be able to type something error-free all, all the time, and you know, uh, and you might make mistakes and so on. So, so the, the the idea is that when the teacher makes a mistake, and then Hopefully fixes it rather than you know okay sorry uh, just uh, just uh, just disconnect the projector and then do whatever and then show again. We if they, if they, if they can just show how they fix it right, uh, then the students can see that you know errors are expected. You know they don't have to be so fearful that they get errors and then they, they, they see there's a process for fixing them. Okay, now hopefully the the process that is shown is 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 uh, is, is right uh. 
know, I don't know what's, what, what, how other teachers correct their code, uh, but, um, but there is a process for fixing them. Okay, so that's, that's, that's something we want to do. On top of that, the other thing that they do is that they give whole examples and then they have practice questions that they, 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 they have to do. Uh, that's not too different. Okay, uh, so that's what uh, Abida says. Right, from problem-based learning, uh, you know, expecting them to basically be on their own, quite, quite a lot there on their own, do a lot of self-directed learning. And then now we have introduced uh, cognitive apprenticeship, not in replacement, but, but, in to, but, but together. That means in the weeks in which a new programming concept is being introduced, we do cognitive apprenticeship, right, and so on and so forth. And, and, then, and then there'll be problem-based learning uh, in the weeks where they are just, you know, uh, uh, applying some of these concepts. Okay. So, uh, takeaway. This is a Chinese takeaway box, but uh, we don't get it here actually, right? But anyway, so I think teacher training is key. Uh, even for uh, even for where we are, a uh, good teacher basically knows more than any. No, will have no more than one way to teach a particular subject, right? And knows how to change methods for a given student. Okay, because all students are different. Uh, and for us at RB, uh, the, the emphasis on the individual student is is quite high. It's not just like you know teaching you know one person to a whole bunch of all of you, and you know I really don't know where you are you know uh, with regards to any subject matter, right? So, but but in RB PBL, the student gets an individual grade, so a teacher needs to know each individual student and where they are and so on. So there's a lot of effort. Okay, um, a characteristic of a te of teacher expertise is also knowledge about what students typically get wrong, and, and that's where you know selecting the right. Kind of teachers are, are important uh, because you know if they have if they have programmed professionally before and so on, uh, they, they can address those misconceptions and then lead students to discover and correct the misconceptions that they make. Uh, versus somebody who is a textbook programmer, you know, a, a textbook teacher, lah, effectively. In some cases, uh, they're two weeks ahead of the students per se. So uh, uh, you know, sometimes that happens, you know. Uh, the, the other one is basically knowledge about how to broaden participation in computing and, and I say that because um, one of the things that we, we always try to encourage students is how to is the engagement with the students when one makes computing fun and sexy for them. Unfortunately, sometimes we have teachers, uh, the way they teach and all that uh, makes computing such a bore and such a, so painful and, and they don't want to do programming. Okay, And, and that's something that we... Uh, I mean, one of the questions being asked is that, uh, you know, the students from O level come to the poly. Okay, because we, we okay, um, because we get situations where students who after they do our, our module, right, sometimes they say, oh, I don't like programming. You know, programming is very tough and so on. Then, then, the, then one would say that, but before they actually did the, your module and they're coming from the schools, they haven't done programming before. Some, quite, quite a large of them. So, so you might say that, you know, so why, there is no reason, I guess, why they should say they don't like programming if they haven't done it before, right? Right. But then, why after they do your module, then they like they don't like programming? You know, this is something to do with the teaching, or how, the, how the teaching is done, or the teacher. So, you know, so that's something that we constantly have uh, looking into: uh, how teachers can engage them, how they can make the, the classes fun and, and interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, I won't go about that. Okay. So, having said all that. My last slide basically says, uh, yeah, we, so, so at RP now we work really hard, we get students who are not so strong academically, but at the end of the day, they, after three years or sometimes more, they do graduate, they go out of industry, and based on the graduate employment survey that all the bodies do, uh, you know, uh, we find that, hey, our students uh, still get employed, uh, their starting salaries are no different from all the other bodies. And you know, there's a bunch of them who actually do quite well. You know, they do their own startups, they build up their own, yeah, and so on. And they get attached to come to our, the companies that you would expect here in Singapore. So, yeah, so we don't do too bad uh, at the end also. But, uh, okay, that's, that's, so that's, uh, that's my, my, my last slide. And any, any questions? to solve a problem, uh, you know, so what, 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 what uh, 
do is that, you know, I, I, I basically code from scratch. Huh? You know, in some cases, if the program I had to write was quite long and I can't really code everything from scratch, and some bits are just pretty much standard, I'll just start with a certain base, base, base code, huh? right? And I'll just show them what I'll do. You know, I'll code to the, I'll show them you know, why I code this particular portion first. And after I code that particular portion, I, you know, I want to test it, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. I walk through them that process, okay, and then they, they can see it. Uh, and then uh, later on, I just build on it and I explain why. It's just having to explain to the students why. Uh, because I think most times what students get, uh, I'm not sure if this is, still happens, I presume it does, you know, somebody will just say, here's the solution. All right? All right, here's the pro problem you need to solve, here's the solution. But uh, maybe not enough explanation to how did that solution come about. All right? So we try to do that in class, we try to model that. So is this within the one day? Yes, it is within the one day. Yeah. Because that's the current structure in, in RP. Um, so, I mean, what I'm trying to say there is that if you are thinking of doing problem-based learning and you want to have more interesting context, maybe the structure uh, you, is something that you need to look at. I'm not sure if everything can be solved, if you like, within one day. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Can you give us an example of a problem that the students have responded well to? You, you're asking for a sample of a problem now? I, I don't have one now, uh, but I, 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 I could share it with you, uh, you know, uh, later today. Um, uh, although the yeah, side story is uh, on my way here, a, a lady decided to, you know, uh, kiss the back side of my car, uh, so I have to send it to the workshop later. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, I'll, I'll be around at some point, so I can share with you. Anyone else is okay. Yes. Uh, all computing students are equipped with uh, their own computing devices to do the programming? Yes. In RP, every student has their, has their own laptop. So is that a DIY model or? Oh, they, they have to buy their own laptop. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a requirement. I mean, like I said, we have a lot of students who are financially uh, needing assistance for those cases that are body was will, will in some way support, support uh, as well. But everybody has their own device. Any other question? Can you, yeah. can you share a little bit on the practical like environment? Uh, you say you use Python, do you use other installation, or you use something else, or you go to online uh, types of uh, environments where you can do coding? I, I think they just use the standard ID. I can't remember what is the data. I don't know that they're using. Was it? I don't know. I, I think they use, uh, not just idle, I think they use something else as well, you know. No, no experiments in, like, some, some, some students who will like programming will find a better, better text editor or something like that. They, they would, no, no one stops them from trying any, anything that they like. Maybe they can use anything. Right? For that matter, we don't care what they use, uh, as long as they can write a code. So, but, but from the, the, the subject matter, I think they do, you know, suggest something. They tell them they can install something, you know, but they can try something else if they want to. Yeah. Any other, any other question? No? Okay. Is it? Ben? Is it your turn? <laughs>